I'm Bob Ellsworth, uh, Director of Mainframe Transformation at Microsoft. I'm Steve Stewart, uh, CTO of Estadia. And I've been with Microsoft for just 18 years. Uh, prior to that, I spent 30 years uh, working on mainframes, both for IBM and for Amdahl. I started this mainframe transformation initiative uh, about 10 years ago, helping customers uh, migrate uh, their existing mainframes to take advantage of the latest technology. Yeah, and uh, I'm Steve Stewart, a CTO of Estadia. We've been doing uh, legacy modernization strategies for the last 20 plus years. Uh, looking forward to explain how we do these things today. Great, thank you, Steve. And when we think of uh, mainframe transformation, it really is about taking advantage of the latest technologies, as I mentioned. And we, we think of Azure as the new mainframe. And as we go through this uh, presentation, you'll learn why uh, Azure is the new mainframe. We've been experiencing an amazing uh, time in, in the industry and in, in technology. And it's a lot like uh, the, uh, the transformations that we've seen in the past and the revolutions that we've seen in the past. You think of revolutions as those that drive a huge impact uh, to society, uh, to uh, economics, uh, to transportation. And that really started with the, the steam engine and the steam revolution and the industrial revolution. Uh, the second revolution being the electrical revolution with the advent of electricity, you know, followed by electronics and IT. And this is when I started programming back in 1969, 1968. And today we're in another uh, huge impact in society, which is the digital revolution or digital transformation. When you think of the digital transformation, really the, the technology that's driving that is the advent of cloud capabilities and the ability to deploy solutions and technologies in IT outside of the data center. And this spans the gamut from productivity to business apps, new applications, uh, data intelligence, and security and management. But when we think of these cloud capabilities, it's so important to have the key functionality and key capabilities in support of the cloud. And how Microsoft differentiates ourselves from our competitors is the, the fact that we have a global presence, we'll talk about each one of these, uh, that we're highly trusted, and also the opportunity to take advantage of the cloud when it makes good business sense through hybrid technologies. So when you think of the investment that Microsoft's made in technology, uh, in the data centers worldwide, uh, we have more data centers uh, than our co competitors. We've got 54 regions worldwide, uh, available in 140 countries. And most importantly, when we think of Azure as the new mainframe, it's about the high level of availability that we've created through the availability zones. Uh, we continue to expand uh, our investments and provide data centers uh, where customers need them on a global basis. When we think of, of trust, you know, back in the, the mainframe days when we're building custom applications in the data center, it was really up to every customer to ensure that they abided by the, the industry standards uh, for their particular industries. Uh, and the same applies in, in the new days in, in this digital transformation and using the cloud. It's so important that the cloud provides the highest level of trust and has the accreditations required to support each industry that wants to use the cloud. Uh, our cloud is the most trusted and compliant cloud available. As I mentioned, hybrid is one of the areas that Microsoft really differentiates ourselves. And the idea and the reason we invested so much in providing a hybrid environment is that we want to be sure that you take advantage of the cloud when it makes good business sense. And also that we make it easy uh, to have a hybrid environment to support both your on-premise uh, utilization of technology and the cloud utilization of technology. We've done this through consistent identity, applications, data, and management. A couple of uh, great examples is uh, Active Directory. You know, everyone uses Active Directory to be able to authenticate users within the data center. And we've created an Azure Active Directory so you can have a common identity. We replicate between your on-premise Active Directory and the Azure Active Directory. So no matter where you run your applications, you can authenticate users against the same information. We make it easy to, to manage both the on-premise environment and the Azure environment through integrated management and security technologies. We also have consistency in data so that your on-premise SQL server, you're able to replicate that up and use Azure Data Services and have a consistent data platform. And lastly, the, the DevOps environment, uh, we have consistency there where you can build applications to run in the cloud and through Azure Stack, 
you have the ability to run those very same advanced services applications uh, within your data center. Now, to illustrate this hybrid platform strategy, you know, just imagine today you know, you're running the majority of the work in your own data center with your own infrastructure. You've got racks of, of x86 running Windows and Linux. Uh, perhaps you have mainframe environments or mid-range environments. And the importance is your ability to go beyond the data center and take advantage of new technologies and capabilities in the cloud. And that's where the Azure Public Cloud comes in uh, with the Azure Global Data Centers. We provide infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and advanced workloads, uh, including software as a service. And again, this way you can take advantage of the cloud when it makes the best business sense on an application by application basis. One of the most mature ways of using cloud services is software as a service. And for Microsoft, this includes things like Office 365, you know, Dynamics, CRM and, and AX, um, and also a global software as a service marketplace. So if uh, an application is one you can simply consume and not have to maintain or support yourself, it makes good sense leaving the burden on the cloud provider uh, and using software as a service technology such as Office 365 and these others. In addition, if you do have a need to run your, your advanced applications consuming advanced services and run those within your data center, you may have a data sovereignty challenge where you need to keep your data within the, the walls of your data center, you now have the ability to use Azure Stack. So you can build those same applications, run those in the public cloud when it's appropriate, or use those same advanced services applications such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, and run those within your data center itself. Now, when we think of mainframe and how this fits into this new world of digital transformation, most customers uh, in your mainframe environments, uh, it's a very expensive IBM Z series or Unisys mainframes, a very expensive platform to be running today. And that's just the beginning. As we've engaged with customers around the world, uh, the number one issue historically has been cost. And by doing a mainframe transformation, moving out of those uh, legacy mainframes, running those workloads uh, in uh, an x86 platform and now in the cloud, you're able to substantially reduce costs. But that's just the beginning of the journey. So mainframe transformation is all about taking advantage of reducing costs, moving to x86, but it's also about going beyond that and being able to consume advanced services. You know, you think of the application model back in uh, the, the early 2000s, it was all about web services and services-oriented architecture. And that was one of the first ways of building a custom application and going beyond a single platform to other platforms within your data center. Well, today the cloud is, is really that next step in the evolution of application development where you can build applications and you consume services rather than have custom applications provide those services. Great example is cognitive recognition. You know, no one would want to start from scratch and build your own cognitive recognition application. Uh, such as facial recognition, text, or voice recognition. Instead, in modern application development, you consume those services from the cloud, from Azure. The same thing with artificial intelligence and machine learning. You wouldn't want to build those systems from scratch when you can consume those services from the cloud. When you transform your mainframe and take your existing workloads through technologies like rehosting, move those into the cloud, you're then able to extend those applications and consume those advanced services. So it's a way of continuing the journey uh, on your mainframe transformation. Now we think of mainframes, and, and those of you that have worked in mainframes uh, for a number of years, and that's really your history, I, I really share that history with you. As I mentioned, I, I started in IT back in 1971. And I spent 30 years uh, working on IBM and, and Amdahl, a competitor to IBM, I uh, spent 24 years at Amdahl uh, working on mainframes. And when I, when I came to Microsoft, I was in the Windows Server team responsible for enterprise credibility, uh, reliability, availability, serviceability. I came in with a list of 150 enhancements, which we need to make to Windows and SQL to be more enterprise capable. I had the opportunity of, of going in front of Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and asking for an investment uh, to allow us to improve the reliability, availability, serviceability of Windows and SQL. I got that investment and then I drove uh, tremendous product changes uh, in the Windows Server team. 
several of those product changes uh, continue to grow and, and be enhanced today. And let me, let me walk you through some of those. When we think of reliability, a big key area of that is to be able to capture and recover errors. In the mainframe on the IBM 370 that I started working on in 1972 when it was first released, there's a capability called uh, alternate CPU recovery. And what that did was it captured CPU failures and allowed the processor to be taken offline and the system continued to run. Uh, later on in 1986, IBM came out with processor availability feature where we actually recovered the application that was running at the time the processor failed. Well, when I came to Microsoft and uh, worked with engineering, I asked them, well, what happens if you lose a processor? And I was told, well, you get a, you get a blue screen, of course. Well, that's not very modern. That doesn't deliver the reliability you need. So I worked with engineering and Intel to create the machine check architecture for Itanium, which then we implemented in the Halem. And this allows us to capture those hardware errors, just like processor availability feature, and recover from those hardware errors. You think of availability and avoiding system outages. You know, those of you working in the mainframe are very familiar with technologies such as parallel sysplex using the coupling facility and then geographically dis dispersed parallel sysplex. But we've replicated that same functionality uh, in Azure. So initially with SQL, always on, high availability for sharing SQL databases, recovering from those across systems, Azure site recovery and concurrent system patching, and also with the Azure implementation of geo-replication services. You're able to go across uh, large geographies and ensure that if there's a catastrophe in one location, you're able to fail over to another Azure data center. We think about serviceability and that ability to maintain your system externally. On the IBM mainframe, you have the independent service processor. And in Azure, we've got an Azure management console, which is separate from the VMs or the services you're utilizing. We also have the virtual machine manager. We think of, of virtualization, which everyone's familiar with on the mainframe, um, ZVM, which started with VM370 in 1972, uh, first system I worked on, and PRISM, logical partitioning. Well, at Microsoft, when I came to Microsoft, we didn't have a virtualization technology. I have three patents in virtualization on the mainframe, and so I led the charge uh, to acquire Connectix to become our virtual technology. We first released virtual server, which became in integrated into our system called Hyper-V, and it also provides the virtualization capabilities of Azure. We think about security on the mainframe. You either use RACF or Top Secret or ACF2. And in Azure, we use Azure Active Directory. Um, and this allows you to have uh, authentication uh, for users as they sign into the system or as they access applications. and allows you to provide the uh, same information during a mainframe transformation, we replicate information out of the mainframe security systems into Azure Active Directory. You know, on the mainframe, uh, you typically don't run 100% you know, utilized every day. You've got peaks and valleys in utilization. At month end, you may turn on additional processors called capacity upgrade on demand. This again is one of the patents that I, that I achieved at Amdahl and that IBM cross-licensed uh, for their capacity upgrade on demand. And in Azure, we have a very similar capability, which is elastic computing. So the idea is in the, in the cloud, with the new mainframe, you only pay for what you use. So by only using additional capacity when you need it, you're not having to keep that capacity in reserve and pay for it uh, when, you're, when you're not needing that additional capacity. When we think about turning data into action, it really is about uh, new functionality, new capabilities to do machine learning and AI, which is provided by Azure. On the mainframe, of course, you may be using Cognos, SAS, Watson, and others. But in Azure, you've got all kinds of new technologies that are coming to market every day to turn data into action. You know, we think about uh, the development environment, and hopefully you've moved beyond using TSO ISPF for doing application development and using technologies from IBM, IBM Developer for Z, which runs on Eclipse. Well, of course, in Azure, we also have support for Eclipse and Visual Studio, uh, which is called Azure DevOps. By using Azure DevOps, you're able to attract new kids out of college that know Eclipse or Visual Studio, and they can uh, use their knowledge of these development environments to maintain existing uh, legacy applications such as COBOL applications. And lastly, we think of modern application development going beyond, um, beyond the developer tools 
to deploy technologies in new ways uh, through Kubernetes services and through Azure Service Fabric. Those capabilities are not available on the mainframe. So hopefully this gives you some ideas of not only how Azure delivers similar capabilities to a mainframe in reliability, availability, and serviceability, but also how Azure goes beyond what you can do in the mainframe to allow you to embrace new advanced workloads, new modern ways of doing uh, Azure DevOps, and also new ways of deploying applications and solutions. So with that, let me uh, pass it on to uh, Steve to talk much more about uh, the, the implementations of Azure in the new mainframe. Well, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Bob. And, and one of the things that is very exciting as a, as a company has been involved in legacy modernization, this is probably the most exciting time there is, mainly because a lot of times we were just doing an infrastructure play, just moving it to a lower cost platform. But being able to leverage cloud and all the services that, and the frameworks that are contained within Azure, you're able to expand a lot of your existing data and leveraging it to Power BI AI machine learning. So I'm going to kind of walk you through a little bit about, uh, you know, the how we do these things. But before we start that, you know, uh, Estate has been in this business for well over 25 years uh, doing legacy modernization strategies. We started off offloading development uh, to, you know, Xenix and Santa Cruz operation uh, Unix boxes way back in the day. And uh, since then, we've done, you know, we had clients that were kind of offloading development dev tests. And they said, hey, since I'm testing, can I run it? And in 1994, we did our first mainframe migration. We've done about 200 since then. The last 18 months, we've seen an exponential growth on moving uh, workload to cloud and the investments that Microsoft has done into Azure, where you actually created, you know, Azure to me is the new mainframe. It has all the capabilities. It can scale. It can meet the performance. And we're talking to clients right now. They're in the 300,000 MIP range uh, going to cloud. So the cloud is ready, uh, ready to go. Um, Estadi was awarded the uh, uh, top performer for uh, mainframe to Azure, and uh, that's our CEO, uh, Scott Silk, and Bob is, is right there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how we actually do these things. Uh, you know, if you look at what's happening, there's a transformational change that's happening in government and also in the private sector. You know, the baby boomers are retiring. Uh, Pew Research says there's 10,000 people a day that turn 65. And so there is a what I call a passing of the torch uh, scenario. You have applications that work, they run, uh, that they need to be rejuvenated. And, and so your options are to rewrite everything, which is really complex and, and, and prone to failure, or you try to reuse what you currently have. And so we're seeing this passing of the torch uh, scenario. And if you're able to take your existing applications you currently have and then rejuvenate it by moving it to the new mainframe, which is Azure, and then expose that data and all those things, that's where you, we're seeing the biggest bang for, uh, for the buck. All right, so let's talk about the mainframe. You know, th this is your standard IBM mainframe or your Unisys mainframe. This is the original cloud. If you think about what the mainframe did, the it, it had a, you know, I, would, I was an operator and I would get a phone call from some uh, business user going, where's my report? Where are my files? What's taking so long? And I was the one doing the elastic computing by, you know, updating the priority for that program and, and making sure it got done. So what's happened is that transformation of the mainframe is now turned into the cloud and Azure has now instead of the phone call, you have automated ways to expand and contract and set priorities. If your queue depth is X, you know, at bring up another VM or, you know, those kinds of things. So you're able to scale out and scale down as necessary. So the cloud is the, you know, the mainframe was the original cloud. And now we're going to talk about how we move it to the new cloud, which, which is Azure. And if you, Look at, you know, these are all the components that exist in, in, in the mainframe. Each one we can map to Azure. If you have your assembler, COBOL, PO1, natural Fortran, all of those things, there's a, you know, not everything can uh, migrate over. So there's some things you're going to have to do, but there is a corresponding thing. So if you look at your security from a RACF, you can definitely map RACF, uh, ACF2, and, and top secret over to AD and also leverage uh, SQL Server security for, for those types of mapping. But there is a corresponding mapping session, and this is what we do in working with our partners at Microsoft to do a, a complete mapping of what you currently have and where, where it needs to, needs to go. So we start off with the discovery. What do you have? 
what is your journey? Where do you want to go? And then start coming up with the stepping stones to get you to that uh, that that the the end, the end place that you want to go. We design the architecture. We start modernizing your code, modernizing your applications, moving that over. Testing is key component. One of the excellent byproducts of migrating these applications is is the test scripts that we're going to need. And this is a great opportunity to start leveraging some of the automated test tools that Azure DevOps currently has and can interface also in the open source environment uh, arena, you know, like using Jenkins and things of that nature for automated testing. You have to create test scripts anyways, so might as well leverage that. And that is a return on your investment because that stuff doesn't get thrown away. You can start, you continue using it so you can start moving into more of a DevOps type culture. You know, implementing, deploying it, and also mapping the way you operate your mainframe today is going to change as the way you operate uh, on Azure. So we'll walk you through that, and then you know, then you're you're running on on that platform. Uh, what one of the things that we've seen is you know we have to do that mapping of everything, and what we you know basically everything you currently have on the mainframe there is a corresponding thing so we talk about you know rack f to ad but things are now available to you that you you know if you look at azure oms you're able to monitor your applications react to it if something occurs uh start leveraging you know all the different things that exist on the azure framework and where where to me where the real juice comes in is being able to expose your dormant data into ai machine learning and be able to uh, identify trends and, and react to those kinds of things so you know we always talk about you know we have a mainframe and people have gone into the cloud or even a, on an on-prem uh, service offering, but they never really designed it to be like a mainframe class. If you're going to embrace the cloud and you have a mainframe today, treat it like a mainframe. Create these high availability uh, architectures. Leverage what you currently have. Here's an example at a very high level of how we provide that fault tolerance, fault resiliency uh, at, uh, framework. You know, we use like uh, create multiple regions, use Azure Traffic Manager. We uh, Bob was just talking about, uh, you know, SQL replication services, but we do, a, you know, geo replication services. So the data is in synchronized between multiple regions. You know, load balancer is your queue depth gets to a certain amount, spin up another program, being able to meet those requirements. So you're able to expand and contract as necessary. But here's a classic example from a very high level of how you, you can architect and deploy uh, a mainframe class within Azure. You know, one of the things that we do is that not only how do we deploy my mainframe in there is what do, what is in my mainframe? What you think you know about your applications ain't so. It's a, it, and that is because a lot of times the last great application portfolio assessment project that you guys have done was Y2K. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, you need to look at what you currently have and understand the relationships and everything that you have in there and start identifying what are the groups of programs that want to bring down. We use tools to identify those things going through your JCL or your WIFL uh, and your programs get, get called and look at all these different things. If you look at the series, we have three distinct, uh, you know, what I call star systems here that if you take one and bring it on down, that you know, what are the dependencies when I slice that out? Do Can I update a file 30 seconds later? Does it have to be, if I update a record on the on the cloud, do I need to update a record that exists on-prem in, in my hybrid solution? What are the SLAs for that? Do I need to do two-phase commit? These are the forks in the road when you're doing your modernization strategy. We will work with you to identify. And we can walk through it. Some cases, you may not be able to take one star system. You may have to take the whole thing. But, you know, it's a case-by-case -case, uh, scenario. But we leverage tools to kind of identify what you currently have. And these are examples of some of the tools that we use here where you can actually drill down into the program, see where you are in relationship to your star system. Everyone's got their own star system. And kind of walk through uh, some of these things and then we can kind of identify you know what is your roadmap based on what you currently have and there may be a scenario where you know I always akin the mainframe to like my my parents garage when we had to move into a smaller house <laughs> you know you got to go through and start purging what you currently have you know what are the applications that do an application rationalization initiative to identify the programs and applications that actually meet the demands for your business and are aligned to that and start reducing your dependencies on apps you got to clean out your garage for that 
or you clean out your mainframe for that. And we can help you with that uh, portfolio assessment. These are just some more screenshots around that. But let's talk about, you know, what is the art of the possible after you've taken your applications and move it on down? Um, I want to address one quick thing is that a lot of times people ask, I got this mainframe. It's super powerful. It runs really fast. It has I.O. Are you are you telling me that you can run this on the cloud? I'm telling you, you can. And there's a couple of things that happened over the years that allow us to do that. One is the mainframe, no doubt, has a super highway for I.O. You know, with the advent of SSD, you know, when there's like optimization strategies on the mainframe to maybe partition data and do things like that to is there you know basically you're dealing with the spindle and the and the spindle and the and the disk up there and we're leveraging ssd on this side that you're able to meet a lot of those uh, the io commands uh, demands also because of ai and machine learning the demand for faster chips on intel and amd which are the chips that are in the cloud infrastructures that azure has those chipsets now exceed the capacity for a cobalt transaction that with cheap memory and SSD, you can move massive workloads in there. Like I said, we're talking to 300,000 companies today, but they're not taking 300 th uh, MIPS right out of one gate. They're taking an LPAR at a time. So you can take, you know, as big as a mainframe you currently have and configure it and run it on there. Now, so that means you have the processing capacity. Now we're able to extend, if you look at, you know, these are just some things I brought up that, you know, Azure currently has from uh, cognitive services, vision, speech, language, knowledge, and search. We can then expand what you currently have on your mainframe to other things. I'm going to use some examples like, you know, AI chatbots, AI chatbots that you want to do for, you know, maybe internal for password resets and maybe interface into your mainframe or acts or people that just want to do a quick chat session to inquire about information about their accounts and things of that nature. Those things you can open up pretty easily without having additional uh, uh, resources or personnel to answer the phones when you can answer a lot of the questions via just a simple uh, chat bot. So the, that's an example and, and create those interfaces. The tools allow you to consume what, uh, services and that's how you're able to expand that. You know, uh, vision is another one. You know, we talk about, you know, facial recognition. Bob was just talking about some of those. We have clients that, you know, augment their RACF interface, not going to AD, but your mainframe application now can authenticate you based on a facial recognition. Again, a very simple, easy way of expanding your application, you know, like the whole Windows hello, but being able to put that in front of your, uh, your existing mainframe. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, some of the things that we've seen um, out, out there. Uh, the Air Force is a project we're currently working on today, and their journey is we want to get to predictive maintenance. I want to be able to to predict what type of activities we currently have. So what they're doing today is that they're very reactive, right? Something breaks, I fix it. Every I flew 500 uh, hours, I need to do X, Y, Z. Uh, you know, maybe we identify a defect in the aircraft as we're looking at something, then we are proactive and fix that. How do I get to predictive maintenance? So if you look at what the Air Force currently has, they know what aircraft they're maintaining. They know what the crews are. They know what the start and end time is for a mechanic to do an activity. After I fly 500 hours, I got to change a gasket or whatever, whatever maintenance activity. They know the cost of the parts. They know the start and end time, all of those things. That's dormant data that I can take and feed into machine learning to teach it. If I need, if I fly a C-130 and I flew 500 hours and I need to make this maintenance activity, they will know as you do machine learning what the cost will be. Add that whatever telemetry data and this information that's contained within those black boxes that then you're able to pull down and then cross-reference what the aircraft is, you're able to predict maintenance activities and what parts you have. Right now, they're buying parts for worst case scenario. And then if you're able to predict what my maintenance activity is based on the aircraft and how they're flying, that's how you're able to optimize your inventory structures, your staffing levels. And we're talking about millions and millions of dollars in savings by having that type of information. So look within your organization, you know, what would you like to have from the standpoint of how can I expose our our, our, my data, my dormant data, to be able to take advantage of AI and machine learning for your business, Power BI, things like that. But that's a really great example of how, you know, uh, the Air Force today is looking at Azure to 
expose that, you know, analyze that dormant data to make smart business decisions uh, for themselves. Again, a byproduct of being able to move your mainframe based applications into the new mainframe uh, called Azure. You know, it, COBOL and AI is real. We, you know, we, we use MicroFocus. They've got a great investment into that. Uh, you know, leverage the assets, leverage, you know, for, learn from others. Rejuvenate the applications. A lot of times the CIO or the CEO goes, I want to use AI. I want to do that. And the perception is I need to rewrite everything from scratch. A lot of these systems aren't documented. So how are you going to rewrite something if it's not documented? Or you, you could bring in an SI that doesn't know anything about your business trying to document that and see how that goes. So the best thing to do is take your existing applications you have and rejuvenate them into the new platform. And, you know, and with that, you know, basically, you know, just think about what you currently have and, you know, how, how can we start, you know, leveraging a lot of those things. And, you know, Bob, I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but, you know, this is a really exciting time. I'm really uh, excited about the projects that we're seeing today, leveraging the Azure uh, framework. And I want to thank you for all the efforts you've done many years ago because they're really coming to fruition today. Well, thank you, Steve. I really do appreciate it. And, you know, great job walking through uh, really how to take advantage of the cloud and how to take advantage of these advanced services and, and new functionality that you just don't have available uh, in your data center and your current systems. Uh, it, it is a what you bring, what you really demonstrate. It is a, just an amazing time, um, and the kinds of technologies available uh, to supplement the legacy systems that you had in the mainframe. And the idea is not to not to throw away what's been done. I mean, that great investment customers have made in their in their legacy systems, it continues to to be uh, the crown jewels of a lot of the data centers and and the functionality and the applications they provide to their users. And so the idea is, you know, don't throw away what you've got. Uh, take that legacy investment and take it to the next level uh, by implementing uh, functionality in Azure and by uh, embracing uh, new ways of, of developing new functionality by embracing these services. So, Steve, uh, when you when you think of the customers you're working with, uh, you mentioned a number number of examples like the Air Force, uh, where they're embracing uh, doing uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, analyzing their data in new ways. Are you seeing that with other customers as well? Yes, it, it's, it's across the board, but not only, you know, it's interesting. It, this is a global problem. So we're seeing it, you know, globally, and we're also seeing it in different uh, areas as well. You know, the, the, the key thing right now is that, you know, the cloud infrastructure, cloud has been around, it's not a new technology. Cloud's been around, I want to say, 10 years, at least or probably more, you know, and, and it's now evolved to where it's actually able to take the mainframe workload. So we're seeing it in the commercial and government, specifically in government, there's a lot, a lot of uh, mainframes in the government space, insurance, uh, financial uh, industries, or it's, 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 it's across the board. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing you pointed out so also, Steve, is that the, the capacity of a mainframe, uh, you know, is you can you can achieve that uh, by deploying solutions in Azure. And actually, let me give you an example. Uh, we did a performance study uh, back in 2012. So this is on older Intel technology. It was on a DL980 and a 580 from HP. And we took the very same COBOL kicks workload off the mainframe. We ran it on some Z series uh, in the EDS data center and also ran on the very same workload on DL980s and 580s. And we found uh, back in those days on older technology, on average, we got about 200 MIPS per core. And so I always wanted to know, well, how do you relate an Intel core with a mainframe processor? Uh, IBM Z series processors running full speed deliver about 1,000 MIPS. So it takes about five Intel cores to equal one you know, IBM processor. But the cost of five Intel cores is about 5% of an IBM processor. So it's a very cost-effective platform. And in Azure, with the new M-Class virtual machines, you can have 128 cores in one virtual machine. Workloads that we've uh, done benchmarks on from our partners, our tools partners, we're seeing 20,000 plus MIPS in one virtual machine in the cloud. And so it's uh, the cloud and the, the technology used in the Azure data centers delivers the highest performance possible. And 20,000 MIPS in one virtual machine is pretty incredible. Uh, you know, it really equals or exceeds what most customers are using today in a single mainframe. Are you seeing the same thing where there's uh, some hesitancy from customers in considering a mainframe because of 
concerns about the capacity or performance they deliver? Well, yeah, the problem is that they view it to be, you know, when you talk to the some of these clients, they go, well, I have 300,000 MIPS and there's no way 300,000 MIPS going to map to a to an instance. Well, you know, you don't take, they don't, there's no such thing as a 300,000 MIP LPAR. You take it one mm -hmm. LPAR at a time. Like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And that's, <laughs> that's how you, right. And that's how you do the mainframe. So you're going to do one LPAR at a time. And 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 the and, and and the reality is the capacity for the LPARs that you guys, the LPARs to a, an Azure, it definitely exists. Well, and, and you you mentioned also treating the Azure environment like a mainframe, but there's there's one set of differences in an LPAR. You typically run, you know, all of your your online, your batch, your database, everything's in the same LPAR, and then multiple LPARs for for different business systems. But in a distributed system, so taking that that mainframe workload, you don't put it in one virtual machine. You have one or more virtual machines for the database uh, layer. You have a virtual machine for the application layer, one or more. You have a different virtual machine for the tools, and so you're even breaking out the capacity of an LPAR into multiple virtual machines to really map the, the benefits or the capabilities of a distributed system. Are, are you right. seeing the same thing in, in configuring the replacement for a mainframe, uh, a pool of servers or virtual yeah. machines being able to use to, to do that? Yes, d definitely. And the other thing is also when you separate the, the database and actually put it into a database server and have your application server, there's a reduction in the MIPS necessary for that because that whole group is, uh, that workload is moving over there. So we're definitely seeing uh, uh, exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. Well, also the, the technologies are improving from our tools partners and MicroFocus is a great example where the next version of, of their enterprise server technology, uh, you scale out with enterprise server. So you have a different Kix region is deployed in separate virtual machines. And you Sysplex, and, Sysplex and Azure. <laughs> That's <thought>? right. <laughs> Parallel Sysplex and Azure. Insane. And even, even Kix, the, the operator console, looks a lot like Kix on the mainframe. Yeah. It, it's really kicks in distributed kicks in the cloud yeah uh, so it's, so uh, it's it, really exciting it is and one one last area is you mentioned um, you know developers and you know I, one of the things i pointed out was uh, the fact that you can hire new kids out of college that know eclipse or visual studio and teach them in the cobol dialect to be able to support and then extend those cobol applications to me you know with uh, people retiring especially in federal sector we're seeing a lot of people uh, that, that are at the end of their career and they're getting ready to retire. But the challenge is how do you continue managing, maintain these systems uh, when when those people retire? Uh, are you seeing the same thing as you engage with I, customers? Oh, yeah. I mean, here, here's the reality, right? Not, somebody has been working on TSO ISPF for the last 20 years and you put them in front of a, a visual studio. They have, you know, well, what's going on? Because they're not they're not accustomed to that IDE. IDE is really something that's really uh, personal to somebody when they're doing coding. Right. The, the kids are coming out of college and people that are in the workforce are using Java or or C sharp. They're using Visual Studio Eclipse. But the reality is, if you look at today's programmers, program, you know, C sharp is looking at R. They're learning Python. They're learning all these different languages because that's what the business demands. But you have the IDE and the plugins to help you with a lot of those things. COBOL has that in Visual Studio. So when you bring in a C sharp, a good I'm telling you right now, a good C sharp developer with good debugging skills can pick up COBOL because you can read it. That's one of the beautiful mm -hmm. things about COBOL. And so we're, we're seeing the people pick up the, the language a lot quicker because it's in the IDE with all the help that they currently need. Yeah. Well, Steve, it's, it's been a pleasure presenting with you today. And uh, I've enjoyed you know, the, the, the relationship we've had for the last 10 yep. years yep. and look forward to helping more and more customers uh, transform to the cloud. Yeah, same here. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you.